Now, proteins are the working machinery of cells, so they offer tremendous potential to give us functional information about health and disease that you cannot get from genomics. A tumor or a tumor cell might have a 100 mutations. Which one of those DNA mutations is driving that cancer? If we look at the signal pathways that are activated in the tumor cell or in the population of cells from a biopsy, we might be able to understand what's driving that cancer and giving it a survival advantage, and we might be able to find the targets that we should treat with therapy. So proteomics offers something you can't get from genomics in regard to post-translational modifications as the signal pathway is activated. Every minute, the blood is recirculating through all your tissues 70 times. We can imagine that a simple sample of blood could provide a window into what's happening in every tissue of your body based on the shed proteins that you see in that, in that sample. So a tremendous promise for what proteomics can do. But despite this promise, protein biochemists and mass spectrometrists have been terribly frustrated and their dreams have been crashed on the hard rocks of physiological problems and physiologic roadblocks that come up when you try to apply proteomics to real-world cells and tissue and blood samples. Fortunately, necessity is the mother of invention, and a whole series of exciting new technologies have been developed for proteomics that you can use. So my job is to tell you about these new technologies, what problem they solve, how they work, and give an example of what you can do with them. So first we're going to talk about body fluid biomarkers, how we overcome the problem of low abundance and instability. Then we're going to talk about signal pathway phosphoproteins, a fantastic new category of biomarkers. It gives you information about the active signaling pathways. Then we'll talk about briefly about single cell proteomics, some of these, the new technologies that have just came out, come out using uh, physics in a new way to study individual cells in tissue or in individual cells on a platform. We'll then talk a little bit about cellular and clonal heterogeneity as a lead-in to the last part, which is give, going to give you some, uh, we're going to give you some data about personalized therapy where we're biopsying patients' metastasis with breast cancer. We're using that to individualize therapy by combining proteomics and genomics. We'll see if we can really make a difference for these patients. So the, the founding hypothesis and principle of biomarker proteomics is that if we detect a tumor before it metastasizes by a biomarker test, this could be microRNA or could be circulating tumor cells, if we detect a very early stage tumor, then we can have a much better clinical outcome. And that seems to be supported by all the data showing that when we by chance detect a tumor before it has metastasized very early size, we usually can have a very good clinical outcome. So the hypothesis had been if we could just detect biomarkers for those early stage diseases, then we can make a real difference in cancer. But when people do biomarker discovery using mass spectrometry or other methods for cancer, they're usually starting with blood samples from patients who have large tumors or already have a cancer diagnosis or have metastasis. And the real question is, could we have detected that at an early stage, stage one, before the tumor metastasizes? And when we look at all the current biomarkers that have been proposed to date that can be measured quantitatively, a panel uh, this is a recent study done by European Prospective Investigation into Cancer and Nutrition. None of these were able to pick up early stage cancer. There was no significant difference. Not sensitive enough. Then if we look at a number of studies, um, these are some, some of them are from our lab, but these are from other labs, a number of studies showing uh, that the amount of protein that would be released into the blood 
from a very small, tiny, uh, very small, tiny pre-invasive tumor, so, so small, and then diluted into that large blood volume that it will be impossible to measure that unless you have a sensitivity of your assay that gets down to 0 0.01 nanograms per milliliter. And so these series of studies, mathematical analysis and biomarker analysis in tumor samples have has shown that we, none of the technologies we have, in particular mass spectrometry, is 50, 100 times not sensitive enough to detect early stage cancer. And uh, if, if we were running a mass spectrometry lab and we took a blood sample from a patient with prostate cancer, just squirted it into the mass spectrometer, we wouldn't even be able to see PSA because mass spectrometer, no matter how sensitive it can be for a tiny uh, volume of samples squirted into the ion chamber, when you use a complex mixture and you have a low abundance protein, you just can't reach that sensitivity can't reach the picogram per mil that you need with ma regular mass spectrometry. And if we look at all the different markers that we can measure in clinical chemistry, and then those that we can discover by mass spectrometry, it's only in the higher abundance proteins. So uh, mass spectrometry is not sensitive enough to discover any proteins in the low abundance range that could be coming from early stage cancer. And since we're a biomarker, biomarker lab, we set out to uh, try to address this problem. And we created and developed, and these are now commercially available, a new class of nanoparticles that solves the problem of sensitivity for mass spectrometry and any other kind of analytical procedure. These are hydrogel nanoparticles like soft contact lenses. They're big open meshwork particles, tiny about 0.5 microns, and when you just simply dump them into a body fluid sample, they gobble up all the biomarkers that you're interested in, bind them to a very high affinity bait, and exclude albumin and all the proteins that are unwanted that you don't uh, want to study. So I invite you to look at some of our papers describing it. Here's what they look like under the atomic force microscopy studies, and you can see they're very uniform in size. And so in one step in solution in minutes, with any body fluid sample ranging from serum to saliva to sweat, they'll perform molecular size sieving, they'll rapidly affinity capture all the solution phase target, excludes, exclude albumin, complete protection of, from degradation, and many proteins that we study in the study for proteomic biomarkers are very perishable and can't last more than a five or 10 minutes in the blood. And these particles then amplify the effective concentration that goes into your analytical method. I invite any of you to try this. They're, they work very simply and easily. How do they work? They have a very high affinity kind of new kind of chemical bait immobilized covalently inside the particle that will bind with affinity that's much higher than any antibody, not as high as avidin biotin, but almost gets there. And so they'll bind proteins really rapidly and have a very, very, very slow off rate. We discovered these chemicals by looking at all different kinds of dyes that were known to buy, bind to proteins in fabric, in histology, or in allergy testing. And we came up with a series of very unusual chemi chemistries, very low cost. You just immobilize them in the hydrogel nanoparticle, which is about 95% water. So they immediately capture your analyte. And then if you have, let's say, five milliliters of blood, all the biomarkers of interest, because it's a very high yield, not greater than 98% are captured. You take out your nanoparticles, which are very tiny volume with an enormous surface area, and you just then let them give you what they've captured for you, and you have a hundredfold amplification by that volume difference. So for any analytical method, you automatically shift the concentration from a lower range to a higher range based on your volume difference between the volume of the nanoparticles and the volume of your sample, so that we can take something that's uh, it's 
in low abundance, raise it to high abundance, and have no change in the end uh, analytical method. Very good precision and linearity. In fact, it's improved because you have you've cleaned up a lot of the stuff that you don't want. So um, we applied this to general proteomic analysis and for cancer biomarkers and other biomarkers, and we found that we could go down four orders of magnitude lower, smaller in concentration than standard mass spectrometry, even using a affinity collection with antibodies. And so we have a very sensitive method. And so what we hope to do is apply this to have a new kind of biomarker, not just early stage cancer before it's metastasized, but a pre-malignant phase marker, perhaps that's derived from biomarkers that come from the field effect, the evolving cancers, and let's say lung in this case, lung cancer. And so we've um, uh, used the physician's health cohort, which is very well collected blood samples that's collected from smokers and non-smokers, and then later on they get cancer. So we were able to get the blood before they actually got cancer. So we could see if we could find a biomarker that predicts who's going to get cancer. So Dr. Lucchini and our group was able to find a series of eight or ten proteins that were validated by independent blind validation that were very strongly associated in, in rock curves with patients who were going to go on to get cancer and were different between the smokers and non-smokers, implying that there is a difference in the, in the mechanism between smoking and non-smoking. And a lot of these seem to be involved in lung remodeling, lung function, and um, uh, have been found before in chronic obstructive lung disease, some of them. And we're trying to validate them with the collaborators in Dublin, Ireland, to look at bronchial lavage and see if we find the same markers that we found in the blood samples. Another example of where we were able to use the nanoparticles is for a test for Chagas disease, which is uh, coming up from South America into the United States. It's a very terrible disease, particularly for new newborns. And so with collaboration with John Hopkins, we got a series of samples from Peru newborns, and we were able to measure at, in the picogram per mil range, able to develop a test that was 96% specific compared to any other existing method in urine of the, uh, of the newborn babies. This is a terrible disease that's passed from mo uh, mother to, to child too often, and we are seeing it in the United States hospitals in the newborn wings. A last example of how we're using the nanoparticles is in um, lymph nodes. Here we take the nanoparticles and we inject them in, into the tissue or the bre uh, breast cancer tissue. For example, like you're injecting a dye for a sentinel node or in an in a animal model in the foot pad, the nanoparticles go with the dye and are, are and arrest in the subcapsular sinus of the lymph node. As they're traveling in the lymph node drainage from the tumor or from wherever you inject them, they're collecting all the biomarkers, all the proteins, all the molecules present in the lymph. Then we just harvest the lymph node, take out the nanoparticles, and we get a portrait of the proteins that are changing in the lymph. First time ever that we we're able to measure in vivo lymph pro uh, proteome. And here's what you can see if you, without the particles and compared to with the particles, what you can get in lymph, in vivo. And here's the nanoparticles when they're labeled fluorescently into trapped in the subcapsular sinus of the lymph node. And in this example, we looked at the lymph proteins from a grant from the uh, Infectious Disease Institute of NIH, trying to see if we could find proteins that change in the infected anthrax-infected lymph nodes compared to the non-anthrax-infected lymph, lymph nodes. And we found hundreds of proteins never before even known to be in lymph and big differences in proteins that change before and after infection. So these nanoparticles can be used for any purpose that you want to put them to because they're very stable and they withstand uh, normal solvents. 
And several investigators are now growing individual cells on a lawn of nanoparticles to use them to harvest the protein secreted by the individual cells. The second pro proteomic technology that I wanted to talk to you about relates to phosphoproteins. You can't measure, of course, the phosphorylation state by genomics, but the phosphorylated state of proteins in kinase pathways or other signaling pathways gives you information about the signaling molecules that are activated in use, firing in that tumor cell. And since kinase, kinases, phosphorylate proteins, and then this is immediately removed by a phosphatase, the phosphorylation events are transient. Only when the cell is using that for signaling does it uh, get phosphorylated. And there's multiple phosphorylation sites on individual proteins, such as the receptor shown here. So if we could measure all the different phosphorylation sites on all the signaling molecules that are related to, to our drug targets, we could get a information about which pathways could potentially be driving the cancer, causing apoptosis or causing survival, evasion, metastasis. So how do you do that? Well, uh, we, we've developed reverse phase protein microarrays, and there's two other technologies that are also now being used to measure phosphoproteins in samples. There's the, what's called the uh, forward phase array, which is an antibody array that has different antibodies on it. And then you use a secondary antibody for a sandwich to measure the quantitative level of your analytes of interest. Another method is bead arrays, where you have an antibody on the surface of the bead. I'm sure you're familiar with this. And you have a sandwich with a second antibody. The reverse phase protein microarray um, is called reverse phase because the sample is on the solid phase, not the antibody. And then you use the antibody to a specific phosphoepitope to detect the phosphorylation state of the protein, and you come back with an amplified secondary antibody. So when we do this technology, it's very simple. You can use off-the-shelf equipment. You, do, you have an arrayer and a stainer, same as you use in a pathology immunohistochemistry lab. And you array out your patient samples in solid phase, then you come back and you stain each dot containing the full repertoire of, of proteins from that lysed sample with an antibody, then you amplify it. Sensitivity is less than 0.3 cell equivalents per spot. CVs are very good, and between run and within run, and we're CAP CLIA certified for the work that we do, both in the nanoparticles and the reverse phase. That means we had to prove to the uh, certification inspection that we had linearity, uh, we had independent validation, and that we had uh, high precision. So in one little tiny sample, you can measure all these pro phosphoproteins in, um, in one assay with high quantitation. Then if you do an unsupervised heat map, you can see which proteins are phosphorylated together, indicating that they might be linked together in a signaling pathway. And that's uh, very reliable, and we can perturb the pathway and show that the upstream and downstream are affected in time and then measure that with the reverse phase arrays. And we can put all this information together into network maps to map the signal pathway, activated signal pathway network of a biopsy of a tumor, of a few numbers of cells, or uh, in cell culture, or in um, any kind of tissue or plant or animal model. So let's compare the reverse phase arrays to other types of methods. We can see the advantages and disadvantages. Sensitivity is good. Uh, little starting material is needed. And it can be coupled with laser capture microdissection and microscopic amounts of cells for sample enrichment. Disadvantages are you have to have validated antibodies. It's not for discovery. You have to know what you want to measure ahead of time. And, has, and that single antibody that you use for each analyte has to be very, very specific. So we have armies of summer students validating all our antibodies and revalidating them every summer to make sure that, because everything is, depends on that. Multiple slides are needed because in the, each slide is multiple 
uh, unknown samples, but only one analyte. In contrast, the regular forward phase planar arrays, one um, array can do multiple analytes, but only one patient sample. In the end, it's the same number of slides. And the disadvantage of the current convention, conventional planar arrays is you have to match the affinity and the dynamic range for both members of the antibody sandwich on that array, and that's difficult to get the right concentration of those to be in the linear range of your assay when you have unknown amounts of protein. For our reverse phase arrays, we have calibrators and uh, controls already printed on the same array, and we have a miniature dilution curve, so we always stay in the, min in the linear range. The bead array is another method, it's, and, they, and there's a lot of new technology in bead arrays. Again, it's a sandwich assay. doesn't achieve the sensitivity of planar arrays, um, but it's quantitative and very high throughput. Aqua is a quantitative immunohistochemistry that can be applied to uh, phosphoproteins, and it has a lot of advantages for looking at the location of a phosphorylated protein in a tissue if the fixation has allowed that phosphoprotein to be preserved in its antigenicity. And then the last example of technologies for phosphoprotein analysis is phosphoflow, where you use antibodies against phosphorylated epitopes and detect them in flow cytometry. Disadvantages, you can only look at maybe eight, maybe up to 15, but usually about eight at once. And since the phosphorylated epitopes of a protein are at the intersection, interaction point of the two proteins usually, then only a subset of the phosphorylated proteins at that point in time are exposed in the native cell for an antibody to find it. So you can't get as much yield as you could if you lysed the cell. And there's a couple new technologies that are coming out on phosphoprotein analysis that you should know about. This is a wax pattern microarray, and it's a combination of reverse phase and forward phase arrays in one little dot using a wax mask and layers of nitrocellulose, and they put one microliter, it flows through and binds to the antibodies that are in these different layers. Another really exciting technique using a single antibody concept is where you label the antibody with a heavy isotope metal and you blast the antibody off of this, the cell and uh, send it down a mass spectrometer, essentially looking at the uh, mass of that heavy metal that's labeled on the antibody. So each antibody is labeled by a different elemental metal on it, and you just count the antibody blips that you see on the mass spectrometer that way. This has to, you have to use an ion source and you, and you have to develop a uh, system where you blast the cells and put them into a plasma state and then fire the, so you just end up with the metal that's flying down the, the tube and hitting the detector. Very, but really exciting. And then another variation on that is where you take a tissue section you, and you put it onto a, a conductive substrate, then you come back with antibodies to the same heavy metal as I mentioned, and you put that in a vacuum chamber and you blast off those antibodies and then measure them, and you can scan and have single cell resolution. Again, what you're detecting is the antibodies binding to that cell. And as you'll hear more about in this session, there's been some progress made in taking individual cells on a substratum and then blasting them with a laser to volatilize the contents of that cell, maybe even a single cell, and then shooting that into the electrospray of a, a mass analyzer for mass spectrometry. Combination of both MALD and electrospray. That's looking like it's going to be attractive, but so far right now it can only me measure a few high abundance proteins in the cells. And then a the last example is a DNA barcoding method for measuring phosphoproteins in fine needle aspiration. This method uses 
DNA barcode labeled antibodies and then uh, uses the uh, nanostring method to a um, analyze the barcode and can look at um, you know, a couple hundred, uh, it's claimed, different phosphoproteins or proteins in cell culture. The sensitivity hasn't been down, uh, gotten enough to look at many phosphoproteins in signaling pathways, but I think it's very promising. So we've got really good technologies to measure in a multiplex fashion phosphoproteins. The trouble is phosphoproteins in a tissue sample are highly labile and they're changing all the time. It's, when you take a piece of tissue out of a patient, it's alive. It's still trying to survive. It's, it doesn't, it's hypoxic. It has metabolic acidosis, has no blood pressure. And, and we have studied this extensively by looking at time course of phosphoproteins. This is work done by Ginny Espina in our group. And, um, Biomarkers fluctuate both upward and downward as the tissue undergoes hypoxia and all the other stresses that it has as it's sitting there. So when the tissue comes out of the surgery, goes, sits on the pathology um, cutting plate, then it's changing all the time, just like what you heard about uh, in the flow cytometry example yesterday. So we wanted to develop a fixative that would stabilize all these upward and downward fluctuations over time that you see in the phosphorylation events of the, um, of the signal pathways that we're interested in, particularly the drug targets. And so we developed a new fixative that blocks the kinases, blocks the phosphatases, and preserves immunohistochemistry nuclear chromatin for nucleic acid preservation beautifully. It took us years and is under NIH grant funding. We have a really good fixative, and it's only one step. So you just take your piece of tissue, you plop it in the fixative, and then you make it into a paraffin block. You can microdissect it. You can do immunohistochemistry, diagnostic morphology for your pathologist to be happy, Ext extract the protein equivalent to SNAP frozen or phosphoproteins equivalent to SNAP frozen. One step, and it preserves the histomorphology for immunohistochemistry better than formalin. So our pathologists, and I'm a pathologist, like it. Here, here's um, testes, feline testes. You can see the nucleus is smudged under formalin, but you can see the individual chromosomes in the uh, nuclei with our fixative. And very beautiful preservation of brain cells and every other tissue in the body with very good preservation of the nuclear volume instead of other ethanol fixatives that shrink the cell. So now we have a method for measuring the phosphoproteins, for preserving them, and um, now we want to solve the problem of tissue heterogeneity. Well, when we developed the laser capture microdissection a while back, the goal was to overcome the problem of cellular heterogeneity. In this breast cancer sample, you can see that here's the breast ducts in the middle of all this stroma and fat, and if you just ground this up, you would get a mishmash and an averaging, and of course, as everyone knows, you, you know, it's gonna, you're gonna get false negatives and false positives from that. And you wanna isolate only the cells of interest, and in our case, do proteomic analysis, and we see here with a heat map of proteomic analysis that the, uh, if you just grind up the tissue, you get something completely different than what's in the individual cells, microdissected. But the new problem for microdissection and for analysis of tumors in general goes beyond now cellular tissue heterogeneity, goes beyond just getting the cancer cells away from the stroma or the immune cells away from the cancer cells, because now we have cellular clonal heterogeneity in the same population of tumor cells. And it's considered one of the biggest problems for individualized therapy and choosing what, to, what drug to give the patient. You sequence 10 different regions of a tumor, you get 10 different answers, which one do you treat? And so the clonal heterogeneity now is the new level of challenge for microdissection. A while back, we uh, were able to sequence, discover the human MEN1 gene, multiple endocrine neoplasia, it's a, 
a loss of heterozygosity, inherited gene for epithelial cancer. It causes multiple adenomas. And all these little tiny adenomas building up in the patient are individual clones. So we microdissected each little adenoma. And then we looked at the LOH level at what the minimum overlap was of all the different loss of heterozygosities for all the individual adenomas. And the minimum region of overlap is right where the MEN1 gene was, because every one of them had to have the loss of heterozygosity on the opposite allele from the mutated allele. And that's how we identify. We could not have done it without microdissection. And so by analogy, now what we should move on to, we hope, is to use laser capture microdissection to study both the genomics and proteomics of the rare cancer stem cells, as shown in this publication. And what we're in the process of doing using the ion torrent is microdissecting the subset of cells that are proliferating. They're Ki67 or PCNA positive, or the subset of cells that are invading, and then doing genome sequencing of those, because they're the ones that have the survival advantage, or obviously they're beating out the other cells. Preliminary data has already shown that uh, in a recurrent tumor, the genomic changes that you see in the recurrent tumor seem to recapitulate the genomic changes in the microdissected proliferating Ki67 cells. And so what we'd like to do is start with a proteomic phenotyping in a tissue section, microdissect those, and we'll, we're going to preserve the RNA and, and DNA with our fixative, then sequence those and look at the correlation between what actually grows out in the metastasis for the patient and uh, what, was grow, what was proliferating in that patient's tumor. And this might help us distinguish the driver from the non-driver mutations and get rid of some of the bystander tumor mutations that really aren't, aren't making a difference. But this is just hypothetical at this point. We don't know if we're really going to be able to do this. But here, in, but in this case, we are going to be sequencing only the cells that are actively dividing or have uh, EGFR expression or ER expression and so forth. If we take this one step further, what we're selecting out for is a metastasis uh, clone that comes from the primary tumor and then adapts to the, as you heard yesterday, to the soil of the target organ where it's growing. Completely different ecosystem from the primary tumor, and then you have further evolution of the metastasis themselves. Just like Darwinian evolution recapitulated in, in somatic evolution in the tumor, and in, then in the metastasis in the new microenvironment. So, we propose that since the lung, let's say lung metastasis microenvironment and the bone metastasis microenvironment and any metastasis microenvironment might be different than the primary tumor, the way we should individualize therapy is to biopsy the metastasis. Forget about the primary tumor, biopsy the metastasis and then conduct genomic and proteomic analysis of that same specimen, and then look at the data, both the genomic and proteo proteomic information. Proteomic information is which pathways are activated that might contain drug targets that are known. Genomics, which genomic changes might be associated even with the signal pathways that we're looking at in proteomics. So we have a therapy selection committee of physicians and pathologists that looks at that data and chooses the therapy for that individual patient, recommends it to the physician who's treating that patient, and we give the therapy. This is paid for by uh, the Side Out Foundation, which is a breast cancer foundation from girls volleyball. And so they're paying for this trial, and TGIN is the company using the ion torrent, I think, to sequence the genome, and then we're doing the proteomics for it. So patients come in, and they are screened for the study, and they're eligible if they have six months of survival time. Many of them have been heavily pretreated many five, six times. Now, as you know, if a woman has metastatic breast cancer, and she's failed therapy, 
doctor doesn't know what to do. There's no standard of what to do with that patient. You, you just guess what you're gonna should give the patient next. And so we then uh, do immunohistochemistry, fish, microarray analysis, and reverse phase protein microarrays on laser microdissected samples. We do all this in 10 days. We turn in the sample to the central uh, data monitoring group, and then it comes out, it's, then it's presented in a report that all the doctors look at. We make a decision about treating that patient, and then we offer that to the treating physician. And we've treated 20, uh, we've treated uh, 50 patients so far. First 25 was the pilot. Now we're in the second, finishing the second 25, and we're gonna go into 25 more patients. In every single case, the therapy recommended by the committee and by the genomic and proteomic analysis was different than the therapy the uh, physician was gonna consider doing. How do we tell whether we're making a difference for individual patients? What we do is we compare the progression-free survival on the individualized therapy from the, to the progression-free survival they had there on their last period of treatment. As you know, as patients get worse and worse over time, their next progression-free survival interval is shorter. So this statistically is a well-accepted method for telling whether an individual patient is being helped. This way we get to treat everybody. We don't just decide who we're gonna treat and who not to treat. And so the trial was successful. It met all its uh, statistical milestones and it's gone on to phase two of this of the trial. And this is an example of the patients who've had extension in their progression-free survival. This is the progression-free survival on the individualized therapy, and this is what they had at their last therapy they had. And this patient actually presented uh, to, to a meeting, and she was now able to see her son graduate from law school. Very happy event. And we found with our protein arrays that we're having a lot of signaling activity in ERKs and the ERK pathway and the EGF or B pathway. And, but for some pathways, um, we, didn't, we haven't seen very much activity at all, like the VEGF, VEGF receptor, we saw some, but not much. And we, so we have different pathways now in different tumors activated. And our biggest problem with this trial is trying to get the insurance companies to pay for the drug. Because if we find the, the patient now has HER2 phosphorylation, which means it's dimerized and she should, she should get the drug conjugate anti-HER2 or get the uh, Herceptin, but she was HER2 negative in the primary tumor, we, you know, we don't, there's no convention for getting that paid for. It's really difficult. That, so in every case, our physicians have to write a letter to the drug company or the insurance company and try to get these paid for. But patients are doing very well on the, on the trial. And here's, to finish, this is just the last slide, one example of a patient where we combine the genomic and proteomic information to learn a really great deal about what was going on with that patient's tumor. So we found phosphorylation, positive phosphorylation of phospho-EGFR, phospho-AKT, phospho-ERK, and phospho-SARC. These are all one is, is below the other, and the advantage of the method we use, we could look at upstream and downstream signaling in that same patient. We found positive feet, P, Positive P10, total protein, KI67 was, uh, was high, and, but the patient was ER and PR negative, and negative phosphorylation of ERB2, so triple negative patient. The genomic results had showed overexpression of SARC and EGF, GREB2, and if we put this all together, the phosphorylation that we're seeing and the adapter proteins that are mutated or altered, we can then predict that this patient's gonna be a candidate for dimerized EGFR or for AKT, ERK um, therapy. And there are certain chemotherapies that the patient might be um, susceptible to. And so we gave the patient the therapies and we're waiting to see how that patient does. But we were able to then put together both the genomic and the proteomic. If we had just the genomic, we really wouldn't be knowing what's happening or know what, what therapy to to give the patient, but when we combine it with the proteomics, now we can get better picture of what signaling networks are activated in that patient's cancer. 
And so this uses all those technologies, but the endpoint measurement on the proteomics is a reverse phase protein arrays. So I want to give a plug for uh, Dr. de Kooning, who's in Paris, and she's running the RPPA workshop coming up this fall in, to, and, uh, in on October 24th and 25th. I encourage you all to go to this because it's a great technology, easy for anyone to, to use, and it gives you quantitative information with, with high sensitivity. And she's a local expert. And I want to thank all the fun, our funding agencies that provided us our grant support for our group. And this is our proteomics group. And this is Dr. Petricoin, co-director with me. And this is Dr. Ginny Espina, Dr. Alessandro Lucchini, some of the key people that I mentioned in my talk. Thank you very much. Questions? So can I ask you a question? Over here. <laughs> so the, the fixation technology that you have developed looks really, really good. And I was just wondering if you succeed in making it being used by the clinicians, actually, also in other hospitals. How is that going? Because <laughs> I, I know how hard it is to change the, yeah, the habits. Yeah, very good question. So the fixative is going to be sold by Grace Bio Lab. be offering it for, for sale at that point. Thank you. And it's, um, we've sent it out to clinicians all over the world, actually, to Italy, to Ireland, um, all parts of the United States, because under our NIH grant, we're supposed to send out samples and get independent objective analysis of it. Uh, and we had uniform positive reviews on the, on it, using all the immunohistochemistry that the outside pathologist decides to use for it. And in particular, it, pre, it will decalcify bone because it uses a, a acid in uh, carboxylic acid to preserve the nuclei, and that decalcifies the bone. So it's great for bone metastasis. You can't even, you couldn't, there's no other fixative that will even work for that. So it's been, uh, so we've sent it to the bone hospital in Italy, Rizzoli, and they've looked, you know, hundreds and hundreds of specimens and had very good immunohistochemistry and genomic analysis using it. So independently validated in many pathology labs. But as you know, us pathologists are very picky and very conservative. And um, when, when we were first uh, presenting this, they said, you know, never in my lifetime would anybody switch away from formalin. But I think in you know, study sections and principal investigators want to get away from formalin. And here we have a way to do immuno-LCM, where you're preserving everything, and you have a beautiful s tissue section to work with. You don't have to rush. So I think it, it's going to hopefully have a lot of uh, positive advantages for people. And we'd be delighted if anybody's interested in sending free samples for you to try out. Yeah. Um. Can you ask a question? Yeah. For the, for in, here. <laughs> um, oh, you, uh, sorry. You actually, Let me um, put my glasses on. Yeah. Um, so the talk was uh, very interesting. Um, you are mainly focusing on the um, um, cancer in, in the tumoral cells themselves, but what about the stromal cells and how the whole body is responding because in, in the cancer, you have cells are obviously uh, interacting um, Absolutely. maybe not so easily with uh, the body. Oh, yeah. and not oh, it's a very, very good question and absolutely correct. And so we do. We micro-dissect the stroma as well as the primary tumor. And for the iSPY trial that, we're, that we do and for the other clinical trials that we do, we're dissecting both the stroma and the tumor cells in the same patient, and we're comparing 
the proteomic signaling pathway differences in, in, over time. And recently we presented at AACR, we microdissected the stroma of metastasis and stroma of primary tumors and compared them to the, uh, the, the tumor cells themselves and in different types of metastasis, finding that the stroma was very different in different metastases compared to the stroma, let's say, in the primary site, because the, the, the tumor cells induce stromal changes tremendously, and we were able to see that. And we looked at the immune cell const, uh, components of the stroma as well as the connective tissue molecules in the stroma. I think stromal therapy is a fantastic new opportunity for the future. So I I completely uh, agree with you. We have a couple other pu uh, pu published studies in the past where in colon cancer, we found that the signaling pathways of the stroma near to the tumor were very different than the signaling pathways far from the tumor in the stroma. I'd be happy to send you those papers. Uh, Lance, so thank you for the fabulous talk. Um, so you're targeting the, the, the MET, the HER2 negative METs, and you found ERK activation. And have you applied your entire phosphoprotein panel against it? Is that the only pathway that, that looks to be activated, upregulated? No. We, uh, we look at the way the trial, this trial is designed, and that might be different from some of our other studies where we look at hundreds of proteins in the, in the biopsy, we're looking at the, all the signaling pathways that are known to contain approved drug targets for cancer therapy. These are not patients that go on to an experimental therapy trial. We, we, we didn't get IRB approval to go that far, although we'd like every patient, of course, you map their genome and proteome and you say, you should go to this clinical trial because we don't have a drug for you. Maybe we'll get there at the ne next level. But this, we're only looking at the signaling pathways that are, contain the therapeutic target that's in the FDA package insert saying this is the target of that drug. And so then we look upstream and downstream to see if the, that pathway is activated in the patient. And the example I gave was just some of the uh, phosphoprotein changes that we found in that one patient. And now, all the, these patients are any... Uh, HER2 positive, HER2 negative, any type of breast cancer metastatic, even male breast cancer. And, and, and the HER2 negative metastatic patients haven't been treated before with uh, the, the These targeting. patients have been heavily pretreated. All of but these patients have failed. But not with EGFR, anything that would affect that pathway. Well, in, in many of the patients, in fact, every single patient, the metastasis was different than what was found in the primary. In many of these patients, they had an activated HER2, let's say, or activated EGF signaling pathway, but they didn't have that in the primary tumor. But now they have that in the metastasis, and that justifies treating them with that inhibitor. So we went ahead and we've treated patients with uh, herb inhibitors and lapatinib and so forth, and have had some very good responses for those patients. So it shows how you can have selection out for a subclone, um, you know, because this, the primary therapy is directed against something else, and your subclone it can now uh, ha has a competitive advantage because its competitor hasn't been killed by your first first line therapy. Um, thank you very much for your great presentation. I I have a question. There is this concept about oncogene addiction that a tumor will respond if the pathway has a mutation or is genetically activated. Now, you showed that in, in several cases there was no overlap between the proteomic result and the genetic result. Did you go back to analyze the genes involved in this pathway to look for additional mutation, or do you think there is something like um, proteomic addiction or something like that? Uh, I, um, very excellent questions. And there could be pathway addiction. You might be addicted to a certain pathway. And as you know, oftentimes when a patient who becomes resistant to a drug that targets a certain signaling pathway recurs, they use that same pathway. They're just activating it in a different way, have a mutation somewhere else in that pathway. 
Um, I thought that we were going to get the, you know, recurrence of the same pathway just activated at a different place. Uh, an oncogenic, I guess, on oncogenic addiction to that pathway. Did we have, we're not finding that. We're finding some cases where that's the case, other cases where it's a completely different pathway that's driving that, uh, that metastasis. And our TGEN colleagues who are doing the deep sequencing are analyzing all the tumors. At the end, we're going to get samples, hopefully, when they, if we can get, we have permission to get samples again after they recur. And we're going to try to, because, uh, you know, I don't know how long these therapies are going to work, but if the tumor recurs again, we can do the same thing all over again, biopsy that and, and study it. So right now, we do not have any definitive um, generalized finding that says, Oncogene addiction or not, or pathway addiction is, comes back the same. It looks like the tumor cells are just whatever they can use, whatever randomly gives them a survival advantage, they'll, t they'll use it. Um, in our experimental studies, we have evidence that, that clonal heterogeneity is the individual clones are interacting. That's the work from Claudius Mueller, uh, one of the fellows in our lab, and he's been studying how subclones interact with each other in the tumor, in the glioblastoma, and he finds that they some, sometimes they kill each other off, compete, other times they help each other. So it's very, very, very complicated. Okay, 